Smarties, today we are discussing a shift that has occurred over the years in both of our practices towards virtual work. Obviously, the pandemic had a tremendous impact on that. And in this episode, we are sharing how this has altered the way we quote unquote do math with our learners. We talk about making sure you have the right materials and the right resources and the right collaboration in order to successfully support learners with math struggles. If you find the podcast meaningful for the work that you do or the learners in your life or for yourself, we would love it if you would leave a review. It means a lot to both of us that you would take the time to leave a review and make it easier for other people to find the podcast. We spend a lot of energy working on this podcast and it means a lot to us if you find it meaningful. So we would love it if you would share that with others. You can do that wherever you listen to your podcast. We appreciate it and we see it. I screenshot it. I send it to Steph. I put it in a shared album. With that, let's dig in. You want to learn faster, but sometimes working harder is just not the answer. You have to learn smarter. The Educational Therapy Podcast. Hi, Smarties. Welcome to episode 334 of Learn Smarter, the Educational Therapy Podcast. I'm Stephanie Pitts. And I'm Rachel Cap. I'm building a town. Okay. <laughs> We're digging in. Stop. This game is like such a good EF game. You know, I love a good EF game. Okay, so last week I saw Steph and Katrina because Steph's team had their team retreat. So Steph took me and Katrina out to dinner. We had a lovely night. I foolishly got off the freeway. I should never have done that. This is like that skit on SNL, but I was forced to take streets all the way from the valley where I live to South Bay where Steph is and where we were having dinner. It's a nightmare. And Steph tried to get me to play Monopoly. Monopoly Go. Monopoly Go. And I did. I downloaded it. I waited for her code and then I downloaded it and I just wasn't feeling it. And then last night I finally downloaded Township. We are not affiliated and it's a huge time suck and waste of time. But before we could hit record on this episode, I had to make sure my town was well supplied with like, I needed to grow wheat and corn so that my cows could eat and produce dairy so I could make butter. So that's where we are. I've turned off my phone because I want to be able to focus on chatting with you in this episode, but my heart is with the wheat. So there's that. You guys. Anyway, (laughs) so let's talk a little bit about how to do math virtually. So I'll just like remind us in time a little bit. Right now we're recording this in August of 2024. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this episode isn't coming out for several weeks, but... I don't think in January of 2020, either one of us would have predicted how often we are working virtually. Steph and I have always recorded the podcast virtually. We've always worked with each other virtually, Mm -hmm. but we weren't necessarily working with learners virtually all that often. We were both primarily in person in the office, Mm -hmm. in our respective offices. My practice is cap at therapy and our offices are in Beverly Hills, California, and Steph's practice is my ed therapist, and her offices are in Manhattan Beach and Redondo Beach, California. So this wasn't really something we had to navigate until the pandemic hit in March of that year. And it was a quick turnaround. It really was. Right? We were like everybody else. One day we were going into the office, the next day we were virtually for practically two years. And so we really had to figure out some systems and establish some ways of working remotely with our learners. One of the first things that we realized, like everybody else, is we needed to make sure we had the right supplies. Mm -hmm. So before I sort of dig into what supplies we use and how we sort of do things, I want to just say that our practices have never gone back fully in person. Mm -mm. My practice is actually primarily virtual and Steph's pretty split. But the world has shifted and the type of work that people are open to doing is different now than it was back then. So there's been a fundamental shift. And so the reason I'm sort of bringing this up is I don't anticipate that virtual work is ever going away. Mm -mm. It's also allowed for some amazing things like working with clients internationally. And we are allowed to work with learners out of state. And our practices are national at this point. And we have team members out of state. And by the way, 
If you're interested in joining either one of our practices, CapEd Therapy in particular is actively hiring somebody on the East Coast. And we're both actively hiring as always. So be sure to go and explore our websites to learn more about how to apply properly. So this work is like never going away for us. We've gone full throttle and we've embraced it. I really like working from home personally. It works for me and my lifestyle. And I mean, Steph, your office is like around the corner from your house. So it's like you're either at home working or you're 20 feet away working. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I do have the luxury of it's a block away, so it's not that big of a deal. But I do see clients virtually. And sometimes it's helpful when I need to travel for things that are going on in my life Uh that I can still see clients. Even when they're normally in person, I will still see them sometimes on Zoom. Or if somebody's sick or something's going on, we can still see our clients. And that's The other beautiful byproduct of it is that we don't have to cancel sessions just because there's something else going on or somebody is sick and they can still get the support that they need. So I love that about being able to be virtual as well. Yeah. So let's talk about the right supplies. And I will say both Steph and I have taken full advantage sometimes of the fact that we work virtually and I love it. Just remembering during the pandemic, we went with my brother and sister-in-law to Palm Springs. All of us were working. Mm -hmm. We were all working the whole time, but it was just great to not be in LA. It was great to have a house that we were all in together and a pool and stuff. So that was wonderful. Okay, so the supplies that you need, and we will send these out in a freebie in today's episode. So if you are already signed up on our email list, you'll have access to these resources that we're sharing. And if you're not yet on our email list, you can get it on our website, www.learnsmarterpodcast.com. And while you're there, go ahead and sign up for our email list so you don't have to miss out in the future. So the first thing you absolutely need is a really good document camera. Definitely set it up prior to session. Don't do what I did, which is like set it up a minute prior to the session starting. <laughs> Not a good move. Because I just always assume everything's going to like work easy. And for the most part, I know, it does. I know. Let's be honest. Steph found the document camera and sent it to me. So like, I don't do research. So if you're sending it to me, you're making an idiot proof for me most of the time. It's a lovely document camera. Once it's set up. It's really good. It works amazingly well. Yeah. So I highly recommend if you're working with learners. And sometimes I have... Learners in the practice get it because it makes everything so much easier on both ends. Yep. So if you're primarily working on math with your clients or with your kids and you're doing this work virtually, it's totally worth the investment. And then you need whiteboards and you need particularly graphing whiteboards and you need really good draw race markers Um, I prefer the fine point, but I also highly encourage and recommend different colors. The darker colors do tend to come up better, but all the colors work. And on this document camera, they all work. So those are like the fundamental supplies that you're going to need on your end. And then the second component of this is how do we teach it? So if you're working with a learner who, let's say, is a slow processor and might need to see material multiple times, in an ideal world, you're previewing that information with them. And so there's a couple of different things that you need to do. It does require some increased collaboration and communication with the key players. I always let my learners know that they should be sending me pictures of what they want to work on or what they're being asked to work on in advance of session. That's part of them preparing to come into session. Secondly, I always recommend having a connection with the classroom teacher who can collaborate with you in that way of providing information about what is upcoming. And that can also mean you own a copy of the textbook as well. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of websites that we use, both Steph and I, to create math problems, to find worksheets, to find examples. Because with math, with the majority of our students, you want to do it multiple times with them. In an ideal world, you're doing an I do, we do, you do, which is I do it once, we do it together once, and then you do it on your own once. 
that doesn't work for all learners. Chances are you'll be in that I do, we do stage a lot longer than you would expect until they reach a level of independence. And then once they reach that level of independence and they're able to accurately work through a problem and explain everything out loud to you, one of the things I like to do is to create a video bank of videos of them explaining these problems to themselves. So it's a shared Dropbox. It's something that you can record on your end and upload for them. There is nothing more valuable than them explaining it to themselves. Oftentimes learners who struggle with math might have, you know, the slower processing or the weaker memory or they walk away and they forget and then they come back to it and they don't quite remember. And so that revisiting of information is really, really critical. And rather than you explaining it to them every time, remember our goal is independence and autonomy. So having that step of saying, I know I did this video with Rachel, let me go back and watch it, can be really, really critical. And then do all the things from an EF perspective that makes it easy for them to access that Dropbox. So put it in their bookmark bar, make sure that it's accessible on all platforms, make sure they have an email started with it, with the link, whatever it is that will work best for that learner, you want to make sure they're set up on their end with it too. Steph, do you want to add anything before we kind of dig into the resources that we often use? No, I was just going to say this is very similar to how we do things just in general when we're teaching math, right? So the difference being like I would create like a math dictionary type of thing where they would write it out. I would do it on graph paper and I had multiple kids create these little booklets so that they could figure out what they needed to do. So you're doing the same thing. It's just you're creating videos of it, which I think is awesome. You could put all those links in a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. It could be in their living strategies document if you're making one of those. Like there's plenty of ways to make this work. But these are just some ideas to get your brain thinking about how it would work for you. And we're mostly talking about fifth grade and up. When math gets a little bit more complicated, there are definitely some strategies and games and things for younger students as well. Learners who are maybe doing multi-step math. Right. We're focusing on older for this because this is a little bit more complicated. And I think people fear being able to do it virtually. So that's why we're talking about it. And everything that Steph sort of just mentioned, a living strategies document, a math dictionary, I think we called it something else at one point, but those are all things that we've talked about in previous episodes. So we'll go ahead and link those episodes. So some resources that you can avail yourself of to get extra examples of problems, which our learners often need. First of all, chat GPT. Mm-hmm. Let's go there. And then CUDA Math is amazing. Those are free worksheets. They do offer solutions. The solutions aren't necessarily the version that you would want, but it's enough information for you to sort of backtrack it. Also, we frequently, if you're working with a learner, you don't quite know where to start with them and you're trying to gauge their level. And all of this is informal. If you're doing informal assessment, then the CSUN offers math placement tests for California state standards for every year. That's just a free resource that's available online that we know about. Yeah, so that's California State University Northridge math placement. Yep. Then Math Aids is another website that's often for younger kids, but those are free worksheets that you can get specific and generate for yourself. Steph, do you want to share more about IXL because I think you use it more than I do. Yeah, I do. So IXL is something that a lot of schools use it during the pandemic. They don't necessarily use it now. But what I really like about IXL is it's a paid subscription. But what I really like is that you can target skills for every grade. And it's broken down by grade, by what it's working on. It has English and math. And so all the way up to 12th grade. So I use it a lot if you need a lot of repetition, a lot. And so it will explain and I can watch them doing it. And then you have them annotate on the problem page and you can see how they work through it and then they answer. So I do that a lot with students and find it really successful. The next thing I use a lot is YouTube because a lot of kids are very visual and you can literally put in very specifically about a type of problem or, you know, something that you need to teach if you are having trouble 
or they're having trouble understanding it and need to hear it multiple ways. So there's a lot of really great math teachers on YouTube. And then the last one, and a lot of schools use this as well, is Khan Academy, which is another free resource that you can get practice problems and work on different things. If I were to choose, I happen to like I Excel over Khan Academy because it is literally broken down. I don't have to search the same way you have to search in Khan Academy. And that is taking brain power that I don't want to use. So I can just literally see on I Excel, it's all written out in front of me, which is why I prefer that. But Khan Academy is a great free resource. With that, Smarties, have a great week. Have a great week. 